Hey ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of Psychonaut Sessions, your home for all things Psycho, where we, in our comics reviews, cover the bungled and the botched, the lost artifacts of the quarter bins of comic history. Just those oddities that hopefully you can't find anywhere else, and we don't want them to ever be forgotten about. The little guy shall never be forgotten. Today we're going to cover Xeno Men from Blackthorn Publishing. I don't think I've covered Blackthorn Publishing yet in any of my videos. It was around from what started, of course, in the black and white boom of the 80s, in 86, and went on for a few years till 89. Big deal about Blackthorn, it was started by a husband and wife team, Steve Shanes and Ann Farah, and they focused a lot um, actually on getting uh, major properties and doing 3D versions of those comics. Um, so like Dick Tracy um, was one. There were uh, Rocky and Bullwinkle, um, Brave Star, Casper, Gumby, a few others like that. Um, oh, I think I might have done uh, Jackson the Hellhound was one of their original titles. Um, so they had a few original titles. Most of them didn't last past, uh, you know, three issues or so. Um, and we'll take a look at, like, one of their more successful ones, I think. Most of their titles, even the 3D ones, were just a single issue. Um, and this is one. Um, but it's very clear that um, they were trying to see what worked. Uh, just kind of creating concepts, throwing them out there. If they didn't work, um, they would scrap them. Uh, so a lot of single issues from Blackthorn Publishing. Um, how they ended up folding is they were able to get the licensing for uh, Michael Jackson's Moonwalker, um, which was very expensive for them, of course. Um, but it flopped. Um, flopped big time. Um, and they had a huge loss, and that's they ended up having to lay off pretty much almost all their staff, and then they were done by 89. So we're going to just look at one of their little things they tried to throw at the wall. Of course, I found it at the bottom of the barrel. Xeno men meet the new race of heroes, a natural selection. And... Uh, yeah, we've got this, you know, it. my my eye was drawn to it. Um, you've got this, like, pseudo X-Men style of script, which a lot of people in the, especially the late 80s and especially the early 90s really tried to, uh, you know, mock off of. Um, but, uh, you know, this weird Sasquatch-type figure in the pentacle. The heroes look very... Um, land nothing really original um about them but the cover nevertheless just kind of stood out to me as like oh this looks charming this looks <laughs> uh something fun to dive into so let's take a quick look um uh, here's an item that they uh licensed i'm not sure they ever actually got to eight issues um, but we got Lynn Wayne on there. Um, and in fact, I'm not sure this actually even came into fruition. I think it was planned. Um, but I don't think they ever actually accomplished this feat of having a series of Star Wars comics. Marvel, of course, held the licensing for it um, around this time as well. But they shared some of that licensing because I think they did a G.I. Joe 3D comic. So they did... You know, some of that licensing was shared. Um, anyway, so uh, let's dive into it. So uh, pretty clean black and white work. The story is done by Joe Judd, J-U-D-T. It seems that he did quite a few just like weird, you know, off the wall kind of indie and underground stuff during the 70s and 80s and the the main thing of note I think he is has more of his stamp on is a bunch of Battletech books and comics 
Um, so apparently he was really into Battletech and uh, supporting that particular uh, franchise and contributing to it. And then so drawn by Glenn Johnson um, or pencils by Glenn Johnson. I think his biggest contributor um, uh, contribution was for the book Sun Runners, which kind of balanced back and forth between um, amazing comics and um, I think a few other like Sun Runners like had its life in a couple of different um, companies. Um, and then Tim Dizon, D Z O N Zon, oh, interesting name. Um, I think went on to actually ink for Marvel, maybe even some DC. Um, did yeah, he did some Flash. He did some Marvel Comics Presents, um, War Machine, a little bit of like Iron Man, um, New Warriors, Avengers, um, and I think he got a start at Megaton. Um, so, he, Tim Dizon's been around for a while. Um, I could see his inking stamp in a lot of different things. Um, particularly, there's an um, old uh, comic called The Realm, an old fantasy comic. Um, I definitely see his stamp on. So, it would be... He's one of those artists that really think... I think an inker that takes over the pencils quite thoroughly. Um, you know, he's definitely... You can tell it's his inking and sometimes I like it sometimes I don't and we'll kind of get into that a little bit um, but here we just have a house and it looks like this uh, figure is sneaking into the house really well drawn so far really nice layout as he sneaks in um, so um, you know great use of the blacks and this is where I think you know Tim Dizon, Zon? I, I, I'm going to just say Zon, Tim Zon, um, really shines um, in this particular piece. So we see that this figure is um, going into the living room and looking at a photo album and starts, you know, kind of examining the pictures. And I'll, I'll just say straight up this right here. This right here is why. And I don't know if it's Glenn Johnson. Or if it's, I think it is Tim Zahn. I think it, because I, I, I seem to recall this in other works of his. Um, certain, you know, uh, views of the figure's heads, like their noses seem so flat um, to where they don't even have a nose. And I, you know, I think they were trying to go for an anime style feel. Um, but it, there's certain there's certain panels in here where it just really bugs me. Anyway, so he's getting a picture. Hey, you! This guy in his house uh, is in his house, and so he's trying to scare him off. Gives him a nice chop to the back um, as he's trying to run away. Um, and as he's you know berating this guy for being in his house, please don't hit me. Um, suddenly. His clothes start coming off Hulk style. I honestly, at first, thought he was like ripping the clothes off the guy. At first, I was like, "What the hell?" Um, yeah, that's what he says. What the hell? And so he, this dude that broke into the house, um, turns into a giant Sasquatch type figure. Um, the guy's girlfriend comes in here, um, and she's like, "Oh, Jackson," and this figure lifts this guy up no and rips his leg in half like that is like wow all right like we're just like throwing down already um but don't worry ladies and gentlemen because it doesn't get that exciting um for the rest of the book no it's it's okay um so we pan to uh, hours later, seemingly, uh, the police have come, and there's this guy that is approaching the police. I don't know if he's a detective, so it's never clear whether he's a detective or just a friend of the police. It's very clear it's a small town and everybody knows one another. Um, and his name's Jackalope, <laughs> so uh, the officer's calling him Jackalope, and 
he's getting the lowdown from the officer on what's happening, and he's like, um, says the the girl claims he was killed by an ape. So this is an ape apparently, and not a Sasquatch. Um, and is like, this is the third eyewitness in two weeks of somebody being killed by an ape. <laughs> Um, so, um, they're just chit-chatting, and he asks where the girlfriend is at, and the cop says that he, um, sent her down to some shop downtown, like some tea shop to just calm down. He's like, okay, well, I'm gonna go check on her. Um, so he goes downtown, it's called Moonbeams Tea and Shop, Tea Shop, Metaphysical Tea Shop. It's really hard to read, but um, some of this you have to decipher. So um, he comes in, and the gal is there, and Moonbeam, I guess, um, herself is trying to calm her down. And she tries to move Jackalope away and says, What the hell are you doing, Jack? And this is great. It was the ape again, wasn't it? Wasn't it? <laughs> Just like... Um, really cutely dramatic adorable um and so uh they try to talk about like what's going on and he's just like well obviously it's a were ape he just kind of like is there's it's not a runaway ape it's obviously a were ape just kind of comes to that conclusion out of nowhere and she's like what are you crazy and it's obviously some kind of a bookshop as well as a tea shop metaphysical and got like a little gargoyle up in there She's like, that's stupid. And he was like, you telling me you don't believe what you preach? And so there's like a book there on lycanthropy, lycanthropes. So I guess where apes is the thing. Um, I don't know. And she's like, it still seems ridiculous. And he's like, there's only one way out of this. Get the circle. We're going to have to do a summoning. Okay. Um, and then we cut to uh, just various photographs and this guy is obviously crazy and stealing people's photographs and like making a family his like own family out of it because um, he doesn't have any so he's just like creating a fake little life so it's very harmless he just wants to take people's photographs and not be lonely anymore we cut back to this group the circle quote unquote which is only three people I have no idea who the third person is. It doesn't really explain. Um, and they literally are naked um, in just their briefs, <laughs> just their underwear, like their lower underwear, not even top underwear, and wearing cloaks, uh, walking through the woods. It's night, and they've created a pentagram, pentacle for summoning, because that's apparently what you do when you have a wear ape. You have to summon something. Um, and they say, let's do it. Hey, something's happening. Big foom. Splash. And we get the this, I believe, is the Xeno men. So, um, yeah. We've got, like, an introduction of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Gosh, eight people that are get summoned into this circle I have no idea who any of them are after I read this comic I have no um, I, I it's um, very strange and we'll see so these people in the cloaks the circle jackalope and moonbeam feel like that they are summoned some serpent spirits serpents spirits to help fight the ape and these guys are like, no, obviously not. And so there's some back and forth. Um, and it's apparent that these people are a group of some kind of heroes. And they they got pulled from one part of the world or another dimension of Earth into this dimension or this part of the... I don't even know. I think it's there. I, it's, it's not clear. And immediately they begin splitting off. Um, it's clear they were like in the middle of a battle or something's going on. There's this whole backstory that we don't know about. And immediately the guy in the cape is like, "Hey, I need to, 
Um, I'm going to go home. It's been way too long. And he's like, okay, cool. We'll keep in touch. And say, hey, we're hungry. And they go back to Moonbeam's tea shop. Um, and so the kind of the issue with this comic is that a lot of these characters, so they don't, they're just kind of wearing regular clothes. They all kind of look the same. So it's really hard with the exception of this dude that this Dracula looking dude. Um, I really can't tell who's who. Um, I'm not really sure that the Jackalope character is even around anymore with Moonbeam. Um, and so they basically, and this is where I'm getting a lot of the backstory. They're just kind of talking about, um, their situation and, but it's very, uh, vague. And then we have Moonbeam who's trying to talk through. So Moonbeam is here that we have a lycanthrope that's plaguing us and we'd really like your guys' help. And she doesn't even know who these people are, but I guess she summoned them and thinks they're spirits. Then the cop bursts in to Moonbeam's tea shop because that's where the cops go when they can't handle something. He's all beat up and he's like, the ape. Um, and so now the Xeno men are like, well, yeah, we should go check this out. The cop gives like a little breakdown of he got called in to a break in scenario and found the ape. And that was about it. That's the gist of that story. Um, so obviously it looks like we have a situation. See, I mean, see these, everybody looks, it's all dudes with mullets. Um, wearing kind of the same <laughs> thank you 1986 and you see what I mean about these like lack of bridges on the noses it drives me crazy um, otherwise that I mean you know it is well drawn and well laid out um, you know I think uh, visually you know Glenn and Tim know how to tell a story but in terms of the writing it's like um, I'm, I don't, I really understand what's going on. Um, and they don't, they don't really have a strong, uh, a discernment of like their characters, um, at all. It, it's a, all their characters look the same. So character design really has something to, um, they have something to work on there. So there's a few of these Xeno men that are out driving, uh, looking, I don't know if one of them is Jackalope or not. I have no clue. They're uh, just driving around looking for an ape. They happen upon a guy with no pants. It's obviously our ape guy, but they don't know. He's acting like he got robbed. So they um, find some shorts for him to wear. Um, back at Moonbeams, um, not a lot of discussion apparently they were they are referencing some kind of battle they were in where they had just met apparently and then they got pulled through that portal where they were summoned and they seem really just calm and casual about okay we're in another part of the planet or something they get a call from another one of the xeno men and it's like yeah we didn't find anything okay come back um and the ones that had found the ape guy get approached by... There, this is one character named Laura Aura. So that's kind of fun. Her name's Laura Aura. And she's saying, hey, it's time to go back to Moonbeams or Moonflower. I don't know her name. Yeah, Moonflower. So they go back and everybody's just like camped out um, there. And they bring the ape guy back. and like, hey, we found this guy. And so he's going to stay with us. They're like, oh, okay. Nobody asks questions. Nobody's like, hmm. We found this guy like half naked out in the middle of nowhere while we were looking for a were ape. But whatever. Um, so later at night, um, they are all sleeping there. And the ape guy sneaks off. And uh, one of the dudes, maybe it's Jackalope. I have no clue. Um, notices that the ape guy is sneaking off and they're like, hey, this guy, blah, 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 ape alert. I mean, he immediately comes to the conclusion, who else would be sneaking off and crawling through the window but a were-ape? And he's like, 
ape alert everyone and everybody just throws their pillows at them so there's that so while they're all like trying to wake up uh, the ape guy basically kidnapped moonflower and was just like i love you and he has pictures everywhere and yeah they obviously huge anime influence here no nose again and he just wants to give her a flower all innocently and she's like you can't do that though and he's like oh sorry um and while she's just figuring out that he's actually just a soft-hearted guy who's misunderstood blah 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 the xeno men come in and immediately start attacking him um, so there's this brawl that ensues. Really don't have a great tag on who's fighting, what they're even doing. At one point, I guess this guy has a power where he makes the ape spin like a tornado. I don't know. Um, they're flying around, hitting, shooting stuff. I think that's Laura Aura. And you see what's happening. They're like attacking him. He's just trying to get away. And here comes a giant truck. Hits the ape. And he's dead. And Moonflower is all freaking out and crying. And she's just like, you bastards. All you do is run around and hit things. I had it under control. You bastards. I don't care if you ever come back. He loved me. And that's it. That's like, this is the introduction to Xenomen, our character. So that's it. This is it, by the way. So that's the comic. Um, so that's the introduction to a whole team book of characters. Don't know anything about them. They were summoned somewhere to uh, war find an, a were ape, and they just killed this guy. Like, wow. Okay, <laughs> it's like. Um, yeah, I don't know if I would have picked this up even when I was young. I don't know if I would have kept going with it. Um, kind of a weird artifact. Um, it's weird that you just that you're introducing a team book, and you're the main character is like you don't even know who the team is. You don't know anything about them, and you don't even really get a name except that Laura Aura was the only one. Other than that, it was other characters. And I read later online, they're actually dimension hopping characters, but that was never made clear in the book. It made it just seem like they were pulled from another part of the country or something. Because that one guy in the cape just immediately took off and was like, ah, I'm going to go home, bye, in the very beginning. Um, yeah, poor introduction. Um, obviously, they are probably wanting to build this out over a long period of time, but... Man, when you only have one issue and when you're an independent publisher and you're just trying to, I mean, you've got to, you got to have something to really hook the audience in and they've got to know your characters. But So speaking of characters, this book has a backup in it um, of Sirius the Bounty Hunter. So this is actually a comic that Blackthorn published um, that I think had a few issues. And it is very interesting. It was done by Evan Thomas. And I really can't find much about him other than this book. Um, there's an Evan Thomas out there. Um, uh, artist that's on Instagram that does monster type stuff. Um, I I don't think it's him because that guy looks way younger. Because um, this is back 86, 87. So, I don't know. Uh, if anybody knows anything about Evan Thomas, um, I'm going to pick up Sirius the Bounty Hunter. I'm going to pick up those comics because they look. This ink job is amazing. This ink work is just crazy wild. He's got this weird line technique um, that's just. Uh, it's got this odd texturization that I just find so intriguing. Oh, my camera is not picking it up greatly sorry it's not focusing uh great right now uh but we just get this like weird um another dimension thing so he's a bounty hunter that works for some kind of dimension council that runs all the dimensions make sure people aren't doing like horrible mean things 
and so there's this weird like hellish type dimension that he approaches in this figure named Spid de Moons uh, basically took over this dimension with his dark magic and is just torturing everybody constantly and of course the dimension council doesn't like that so they sent Sirius to take him out um, nothing much to the writing it's just them talking back and forth um, and uh, Sirius delivering the summons from the council and the demon god monster thing is just laughing at him this character claims to be like a god so you get the sense that Sirius is like a badass if he can take on a god pulls a gun and we see this monster they take up a soul and like squish it and toss it into oblivion and this is Sirius kind of like seeing that and it's reminding him of something and we get uh, we're going to get flashed back here in a minute. The monster starts fighting him. Um, and he's like h holding back the monster to keep himself from getting eaten in its maw. It's kind of an interesting technique. And we get flashed back to his uh, planet that he was on called Golgotha. Weird name for a beautiful planet. And he talks about how beautiful it is golden palaces or crystal palaces and things like that and he used to be kind of a normal guy but at his uh, something about happened at his father's funeral and there it's like I guess they toss their bodies wrap their bodies and toss them into some kind of oblivion or cavern or something in that can canyon I mean and something happens this is kind of hard to follow um, that really shifts his perspective and I guess this is his dad I'm not it looks very female but he's talking about his dad and I, I, I don't know or maybe that's a, a wife that he had at the time who's talking to him around that time and I guess she dies I don't know again uh, the the writing is you know it's meant to just kind of intrigue you this is supposed to be a preview um, to get you into the series um, so we're back, you know, this really cool hellish scape with this, like, demon god guy. Um, he's kind of knocking Sirius around, and Sirius is, finally gets Sirius and just gives them this huge old punch. Kind of cool lettering, and I guess that took out the god figure. And he walks away in this hellish cavern full of all these bodies and really cool ink style I'm like I said I'm gonna pick it up just to kind of um, that really for the art alone I mean the story is kind of cool but um, and very rarely do I pick up a book just for its art I'm usually a proponent of I love art and story together um, but Lord have mercy this was an interesting so interesting preview there. Um, got to add here for California Raisins 3D. That was a that was a license they got, and I think they had one comic out, um, 32 pages. So 3D glasses were included. That was a big property of theirs that kind of put them on the map. Um, but yeah, there we go. Blackthorn Publishing. Um, yeah, there's a few other books from Blackthorn I wouldn't mind taking a look at. Um, as I dig them out of the boxes uh, weird artifact for sure ladies and gentlemen so uh, thanks for watching and a big thank you to my Psychonaut patrons you can go out to my Patreon and help keep the lights on um, much appreciated and you also find my comics and my books at danielmullerweb.com and uh, really Love all of you for supporting my channel. Like, subscribe, hit the bell for notifications, and keep it psycho, you all.